Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Roger. I'm going to tell you a bit about how, how Tor works and what we've been doing lately. How many people here know a lot about how Tor works and decentralized trust and anonymity? And OK, I see quite a few hands, but also quite a few hands not. Great. I'm going to start uh, with a bit of introduction about what Tor is and, and how it works, and then we'll get on to the more exciting stuff. So Tor is software. The goal is you install it on your computer, Tor browser, things like that. And the goal is that you're routing your traffic through a, uh, a network of volunteer relays such that somebody watching your local network can't figure out what websites you're going to, and people on the website side can't figure out where you're coming from. So those are the, the two big pieces of anonymity. Another key piece of the Tor world is the community of people everywhere who are working on it. We've got professors and research groups, we've got free software developers, we've got activists and advocates, and that huge community of people who care about Tor is critical. We're also a US 501c3 nonprofit Stiftung style uh, organization as well. And there are some number of users. It's an anonymity or privacy system, so it's a bit hard to tell how many users we have really. But one estimate has about 2 million daily users. And there's a more recent privacy-preserving measurement that shows about 8 million daily users, which is both of these numbers are, are quite huge compared to what they used to be. OK, so uh, in a lot of situations, uh, let me see, did I just? Yes, I just I skipped a slide. Perfect. OK, so the first question to ask from a security perspective, what's our threat model? What are we concerned about? What are we trying to protect? So we've got Alice over here. She's trying to browse the web to some website, Bob. Where could the adversary be? Maybe the adversary is watching Alice's local network. Maybe it's uh, the local uh, coffee shop. Maybe it's the Tunisian telephone company, something like that. Um, or maybe the adversary is watching Bob. They're watching WikiLeaks, and they want to know who connects to WikiLeaks. Or maybe the adversary is Bob. Maybe it's CNN.com, and they want to learn all about their users so they can advertise to them better. Or maybe the attacker's in the middle of the network. Maybe it's AT&T or Deutsche Telekom, and maybe that means it's NSA or uh, other intelligence groups. So there are a bunch of different things we have to worry about. One of the other key things to remember Anonymity is not just encryption. When you're using encryption, nobody can read what you say, but they still learn who you talk to, when you talk to them, how much you say. And this social graph approach is actually what all the intelligence agencies use these days. Nobody tries to break the encryption. It's all about, let's build a map of who is talking to who and when they talk and who's in the middle. And whoever that is, we'll break into their house and steal their laptop and change things. So it's not about breaking the encryption. It's about learning who is interesting. And that's what Tor is trying to protect. Everybody here knows the word metadata, I hope. And you've all seen creepy NSA dude with his phrase, we kill people based on metadata. So a lot of this, this is the metadata. This is the communications metadata, the network metadata about who talks to who that is, is critical to protect. HTTPS is great, encryption is good, but you need the next layer past that in terms of providing uh, metadata security. OK, I actually only use the word anonymity when I'm talking to researchers and professors and so on. When I'm talking to my parents, I tell them I'm working on privacy systems, because privacy is, is, a, is a good thing that everybody should want. And anonymity is a little bit scary. I'm not sure if I want it. And when I'm talking to companies, I tell them I'm working on communication security or network security. Because privacy is dead, anonymity is scary, but of course I want to protect my communications. If I'm trying to buy things from the internet or research other companies, of course I want to protect that. And then when I'm talking to governments and military and law enforcement, I work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. And again, it's the, it's the same security properties, it's the same system, it's the same users. The goal is to bring everybody together into the same network so that they can protect each other. You need people who look at it as privacy, the activists in the world, and you need governments and diplomats and so on who are saying, uh, yes, I'm going to Israel, and no, I don't want anybody to be able to learn what my affiliation is or what country I'm going to because, uh, because that's my metadata. 
And then there's the fourth category, which is the reachability side, where I want to go to BBC, but I'm in uh, Turkey or Uzbekistan or something, and they've blocked the websites I'm trying to get to. So the goal of Tor is to take all these different groups and bring them into the same network so that they can blend together. You can't have a privacy system only for cancer survivors, because then the fact that you're using it tells people too much about why you're using it. So far, so good. Am I speaking too quickly or hopefully understandable? Thumbs up. Great. Okay, so how do you actually build one of these? The easy answer is you put some central proxy in the middle and you route all the traffic through that. And the first problem with that is what happens if that central point of failure turns bad? And uh, there's actually a, a... Okay, I'll get back to that in a bit. So the second problem is even if that central point is perfect and totally honest, you can still look at the traffic going in and match up the traffic going out, and it doesn't matter if the person in the middle is trying to be perfect, you can still see the timing and volume flows going in and match them up with the timing and volume flows going out. So this centralized situation is bad news, and it's why in the Tor case, we want to distribute the trust over multiple relays so no single relay gets to learn what's going on. R1 gets to learn that Alice is using Tor, but he doesn't learn what Alice is doing. R3 learns that somebody is talking to Bob, but he doesn't learn who is talking to Bob. And there's encryption. I'm not going to talk about that today, uh, but I'd be happy to chat about it later. So this centralization is really, uh, decentralization is really important. Long ago, I was talking to the CTO of anonymizer.com, one of these central proxy systems, and he said, I never answer subpoenas. If I ever answered a subpoena, nobody would ever trust me ever again. So of course, I never answer when, when law enforcement asks. And then I did a talk for the US Department of Justice six months later, and, and one of them interrupted me and said, why can't you be like anonymizer? It's easy. We send them a subpoena. They send us an answer. It's easy. Why can't you be like that? And I say that not to pick on a particular company. The problem is the architecture. The problem is they have all of your data, and they promise not to screw you. That's not a stable situation. You, there's no way for you to be able to learn uh, whether they're following through on their promise or not. So the key for Tor is to distribute the trust so there's no single point that could screw you and promises not to. We want something stronger than privacy by promise. We want privacy by design. Okay, so that was actually only half of what Tor is. That was the network level privacy or IP address privacy. The second piece is application level privacy. So the first one is when I go to a website, I don't want somebody to learn which website I'm going to. The second one is when I go to a website, I don't want the website to be able to track everything I'm doing and recognize me from time to time. So all the things like cookies and font size and flash cookies and uh, how many pixels by how many pixels your browser window is. Uh, there, it turns out there are hundreds of browser level tracking and tracing mechanisms which we've had to turn off. And this is Tor Browser, which is based on Firefox and has a lot of privacy bugs fixed in it. And there are other ways of using Tor. One of the safest ways to do that is a live CD based on Debian called Tails. You get it, you install it on your USB key, you boot Tails, and it has all of the software pre-configured to correctly use Tor, and it's missing all the stuff like Microsoft Word that you shouldn't be trying to use Tor with Tor at, at the same time. So if you're... Uh, for example, the journalists who were looking at the Ed Snowden documents were using tails while they were doing that to make sure that they were as safe as they could be. And just this year, we are finally finishing Tor Browser for Android. It finally got to the point that you could run a real Firefox on Android, and we've ported all the issues, uh, all the fixes inside Firefox, and we're going to have a, a real first-class Tor Browser for Android. Right now, it's in alpha. You should go to our website. Uh, if you're an Android person, download it, try it, tell us about the bugs. Okay, so... This is a gr so the green line here is capacity of the Tor network since 2010, and the purple line is load on the Tor network since 2010. So there are a couple of neat things to look at. One of them is they're going up, yay. 
Uh, another one is there's a whole other talk that I, I don't have time for here about performance where the difference between these two lines has to do with how fun it is to use the Tor network. It used to be, way back when, that these two lines were really close together, and that means there was very little extra capacity on the Tor network. Very little, uh, that, that meant that there was a lot of congestion. When you were trying to use Tor, you had to wait for somebody else's page to load before your page could load. And as these two lines separate more and more, it's more likely that you're going to have a fun experience using Tor. Okay, so there are two pieces to how, what I mean by Tor safety or, or Tor diversity. The first one, the first way to measure how safe Tor is, has to do with where the relays are. So we have about 7,000 or 8,000 relays all around the world. And imagine a, a Tor network that was all in Boston. We have Tor relays at MIT, Tor relays at Harvard, Tor relays at Boston University. Uh, in that case, you're bouncing around a small Tor network, and there are several internet providers around there who get to see all of it and that means they're very likely to be able to see the connection coming into the Tor network and the connection coming out of the Tor network and then they can do traffic correlation attacks to realize uh, this user was connecting to that website. So as we get more and more relays, it's not just the number, it's where they are. As the relays are more and more diversely spread around the world, the set of attackers who are in a position to be able to see traffic going in and corresponding traffic going out gets smaller and smaller. So that's one way of measuring how safe Tor is. Another key thing is diversity in terms of number of users in that area who are using it for different reasons. So for example, uh, imagine you're a Tor user in Iran. I talk to security people who say, okay, here's my algorithm. I'm going to find a Tor user in Iran, I'm going to kill them, and then I'm going to repeat until there are no more Tor users in Iran. And if you're a, you know, a, a person who doesn't understand society and politics, but you're just looking at it from a technical side, okay, fine, solid algorithm. But the, the problem there is the average Tor user in Iran is the average citizen in Iran. They censor their internet, so a lot of people install things like Tor in order to get around the censorship. So the average Tor user is the average Facebook user. They're using it to try to read their kitten blog posts just like everybody else in the country. And that diversity of ordinary people is critical for security. You can't have 50,000 political dissidents in Iran and they're the only ones using Tor because then the fact that they are trying to download Tor, the fact that they're trying to use it, is itself bad news for them. So far so good? Great. Okay, another key thing to think about is the transparency side. So. Yes, we're free software. Yes, we're open source. Yes, we give you specifications that describe this is what we, uh, this is what we, th here's our source code. Here's the specifications that say what we think we built. Here's the design documents and proposals that say why we built it this way. And we need all three layers of that. But it's more than that. We also show up to conferences and explain, hi, I'm Roger. I want to answer any questions you have about Tor. And this level of transparency is critical for community building and trust in the software. There are a lot of other privacy tools out there who say, uh, I'm, I'm going to go by a pseudonym, and I'm never going to show up at a conference, and nobody can meet me, and I'm just going to write good, solid software, and it will be fine. Tor is about a community of people around the world who know each other and trust each other, and that's how it grows. So I also. Uh, hear from plenty of people who say, oh, ha, ha, the privacy project is talking about transparency. That doesn't make any sense. It's not a contradiction. Privacy is about choice. Privacy is about you being able to choose who learns things about you. And we choose to be public and transparent in order to build a stronger system, in order to build a community that, that can grow and trust itself. Okay, and yes, there's always uh, somebody out there who's like, but what about bad people? Aren't, aren't you helping bad people in the world? So there are a bunch of different answers to this, and if you, uh, if, if you think the Tor is mostly for bad people, I'm not going to solve this in one slide. Happy to chat more afterwards. But, so the first answer is, remember that we have something like 8 million people using Tor every day. So through sheer volume, we are like the average internet user at this point. 
And yes, you see a couple of bad people here and there, but all the ones that you don't see are the ones who are using it successfully and happily to get to Slashdot or CNN or Facebook or whatever they do on the internet. Another answer is, Yes, maybe it's a two-edged sword. You've got to accept the good with the bad. Uh, I hear a lot that technology is you know, neutral, so it's about what the humans do with it. I think that technology in, is neutral side is bullshit. Technology is inherently political. It benefits some people more than others. When you're building it, if you don't think about that, you will end up reinforcing the status quo. You'll end up reinforcing the current power structures. So one of our goals with Tor is to think that through, understand the current power structures, and think about how to benefit the people who, are, who don't have as much power right now, the people who aren't governments and companies and so on. If you're a government, you can buy your own anonymity system. You can go out and, and handle OPSEC. You can do a lot of trainings and so on. If you're one person in Syria who just saw some something terrible happen, you don't have any other options besides Tor. You don't have any ways to stay safe on your internet. So yes, it's a two-edged sword, but I think one edge is a lot sharper than the other, or however that metaphor goes. Good people need Tor a lot more than bad people. Another way of looking at that, if we took Tor away from the world, the CIA would still be doing fine, but the people in Syria would suffer a lot more than that. Another way of looking at that, um, imagine two scenarios. So scenario one, I want to build a tool that works for the next year, it will work for millions of people, and I can tell you all about it. That's the Tor problem. Scenario two, I want to build a tool that will work for the next two weeks, and it will work for 20 people, and I'm not going to tell you about it. That's the bad guy problem. There are so many more ways of solving scenario two. You get in a flame war on Wikipedia. You hide your images on, in steganography and eBay. There are plenty of things that don't scale, don't last, and don't stand up to transparency and scrutiny. Whereas we want to build something that can grow to actually provide strong security to lots of people forever. And that's a much harder problem, and uh, it, it benefits the good people a lot more in the long run. And if you didn't buy any of that, I'd be happy to debate more afterwards. OK, another fun thing to think about. The Toronto Public Library has rolled out a pilot program where they have Tor browser on all of the computers in one of the, the big rooms in the library. And they're working on getting Tor browser in every single computer in the Toronto Public Library system which is awesome because there are so many ordinary people in that world who need more protection from the internet. In America, at least, we have laws about how libraries have to censor the internet, and there's a, a bunch of problems with law enforcement going to, to try to surveil what people do in libraries. I don't think Canada is that bad yet, but uh, giving people back control of their information, control of, of who gets to learn what they're doing, is a, a really cool thing to do. OK, so let me uh, switch gears to the censorship side of things. Uh, I'm trying to smash together too many talks at once. So here is the Tor website from various countries around the world. It might not look like the Tor website you're used to seeing. Uh, here's one up there saying, surf safely. Uh, this website is not accessible in the UAE. Uh, here's another one saying, uh, this due to, blocked due to content contrary to the laws of the Sultanate. This one's fun, because if you believe that the website you are trying to access does not contain any such content, please send us all of your information using this form. And then we'll, we'll you know, take care of it for you, whatever that means. So I'm not sure how that works in practice, but I think a lot of people in these countries are, are smart enough to, to not fill out these sorts of forms. But here are some other fun examples. Access to this site is currently blocked. And then in, in Qatar, they try to make it fun. Oops, we're fascists. Oops, we, we blocked this thing. So there, there's a recurring theme where it's not, you know, we're a totalitarian government. It's, you know, something went wrong. I don't know what went wrong. You tried to do something you shouldn't have. Ha ha, this is all fun. So this is the, the first uh, introduction that we had to the censorship side of things, where people would block our website. And that means that when you try to download the, source, the Tor software, you can't get it. And that means it's harder to connect into the Tor network. 
So this was one of the very early uh, censorship experiences from the Tor side. You can see in this, so this is a graph of the number of people connecting into the Tor network uh, from Egypt. Don't pay too much attention to the y-axis. The numbers there aren't quite right, but the, the, the relative uh, graph is pretty accurate. You can see on this graph when they blocked Facebook. That's when a whole lot of people decided they needed Tor. And you can see on this graph when they unplugged the internet. So this is a, a very early experience from the Tor side. Much more recently, here's a graph of the set of people who are connecting into the Tor network from Russia. Uh, and you can see here when they blocked Facebook as well, because they block Facebook and suddenly hundreds of thousands of people switch over to using Tor in order to get to Facebook. And I say Facebook in this case because I talked to one of the security people at Facebook who says they have a secret data set that's exactly the inverse of my graph. On their side, they have a data set of people connecting to Facebook from Russia, and it looks like this. It looks like exactly the opposite of this. So, so we have the set of users who have switched over to using Tor in order to get to the, the Facebook site. But eventually, and this happened in several countries, there, people try to use Tor to get around censorship, great, but that means the countries are going to try to censor connections into the Tor network with the goal of, okay, fine, we blocked Facebook, and we're gonna block Tor so that you can't use it to get around the censorship. So the, fix, the first fix for that is what we call bridge relays. And the idea is you've got a bunch of volunteer users who are harder to enumerate, they're not, they're, they're not a static list, they're not a public list, and the censored users route through these bridges into the Tor network. We'll get back to that. Think of that as a building block for later. So another challenge that we have in the censorship world is deep packet inspection, DPI. The idea is rather than looking at the IP addresses that you're connecting to and blocking uh, filtering by that, you instead look at the, the content that's going back and forth and you look for patterns or protocols or something like that and you block certain patterns that you don't want to see, certain protocols. So in this case, Tor tried to look like TLS because who would block HTTPS? And we had a, a slight difference in the Diffie-Hellman pr uh, prime that we were using in our TLS. Uh, we used the one from the DNSSEC RFC, and Apache uses the one from a different one. And somebody uh, tuned the Nokia box in Iran to look for TLS handshakes that used the DNSSEC prime and cut them. And that meant that over the course of a day or so, uh, all the users disappeared from Iran. And we heard a lot of people saying, oh my God, what's going on? And they weren't blocking by IP address. They hadn't gotten a list of the Tor relays and blocked them. They were blocking uh, all the bridges and all the relays because they were blocking through the protocol approach. And in this case, we figured out what it was and rolled out an update. And a few weeks later, everybody recovered and it was fine. Uh, but this DPI approach is certainly uh, 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 one, of the, the, one of the more pervasively used approaches for censorship these days. And the answer that we have for that is what we call pluggable transports. The idea is the Tor side still takes care of the privacy, anonymity, security, metadata side of things. And the pluggable transport transforms the Tor traffic in some way that's going to make it look like something the sensor doesn't want to block. So there are two main categories here. One of them is you transform it into uh, HTTP or HTTPS or Skype video or WebRTC or stuff like that. So it looks like the sort of protocol they're happy to let through. Uh, and then another answer is you transform it into uh, just a random, a random stream of bytes. And the goal with that random stream of bytes is they can't figure out what the protocol is. Now they're forced to either block everything they can't classify, in which case there's a lot of false positives in their blocking, or allow everything through if they can't classify it. And that protocol works pretty well in a lot of places. How many people here know the story about Blue Coat and Syria from uh, five years ago or something? One hand down here. One hand down here. Yep, okay, one hand down here. Great. Everybody should know this story. It's a terrible story. Everybody should. So a few years ago, uh, there were folks from Anonymous, the, like, on, the online group, uh, and they found a misconfigured FTP server in Syria, which had gigabytes of web logs 
publicly available because they screwed up and made them available. And they were blue coat web logs. And each line of the gigabytes of, of lines was this IP address tried to access this URL and we allowed it. This IP address, this URL, we blocked it. Lines and lines and lines of Apache style uh, uh, logs explaining who was trying to do what and whether it worked from all around Syria. And at the top it said, you know, blue coat. So in America we have a law about how uh, certain com we're, the companies in America are not allowed to uh, sell their stuff to certain countries. And Syria is on that list. So blue coat was, uh, was breaking the law in the US. So Anonymous went to blue coat and said, what's up with this? You seem to be running the censorship surveillance infrastructure in Syria. And Blue Coat said, oh, no, that's not us. And so Anonymous was like, but the top of the log says Blue Coat on it. What, what do you mean it's not us? And then Blue Coat said, oh, well, gosh, we, we sold it to Dubai or something. How are we supposed to know that, that they, they resold it to Syria? You, you can't blame us. We don't, we don't know. Uh, and then they were like, but, but it's, it's auto-updating. All the updates are still working. Why? What do you mean you don't know? You're serving updates to a Blue Coat server in Syria. How do you, how do you not know that you're doing that? Uh, so then Blue Coat was like, oh, shit, you're right. We, okay, we, we disabled the updates. Uh, now we're definitely not helping this at all. Uh, so then Anonymous uh, went and got the serial number for the Blue Coat device and logged in and asked for some updates, and they got the updates. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the end of the story is, um, and then Blue Coat got an award from the U.S. State Department for their cooperation in all of this. So it's, it's a miserable story every step of the way, and it's a recurring theme where European and American and Western companies are building and deploying and operating the surveillance and censorship infrastructure all around the world. And. So I actually went to a, a meeting at the German Foreign Office a few years ago where they were trying to figure out what should we do about this? Should we, should we make a law saying European companies can't, can't sell stuff to certain countries? Should we outlaw certain kinds of technologies? Uh, and I, I'm not a fan of that one because every time people try to draw a line, my stuff's on the wrong side of the line. So I think uh, trying to, to delineate what technology should be illegal is probably not, not so good. This was a fun meeting from my perspective because I was basically the only technology person there. So I would be sitting in the room and at, one, at some point one of the, the diplomats or something would lean over and say, hey Roger, what does the technology community think about this? And I would try to represent every hacker in the world to uh, explain how, how the internet actually works. So I don't know how they're actually going to solve this. One of the, the theories that I heard from Privacy International was don't look at the actual software, look at the brochures that they use. Because there are, there are these huge trade shows where like Blue Code and, and everybody else show up and they have glossy, beautiful documents saying, I can arrest 500 bloggers per hour. And then somebody else says, I can do 800 bloggers per hour. And then the, the Saudi prince goes over and says, oh, I want the 800 one. So actually looking at the, the extremely bold advertising that these companies do, they're, they're shameless. They, they, they're, they're making billions of dollars off of this and nobody is stopping them. Australia censors the internet. Denmark censors the internet, Sweden censors the internet, Belgium censors the internet, England censors the internet. So when governments go to places like China and say, look, you're being bad for the world, you're harming your country, you're, you're not playing well, you're censoring, you need to stop censoring, China very reasonably says, look, I'm just doing what everybody else does. I'm keeping my citizens safe from the internet just like you do. Why are you picking on me? So part of what we need to do is not think about just over there a stand where China is doing something bad with their internet. The problem is all over where we're starting to try to control and surveil and monitor and prevent connections. And, and when we're doing it in Western countries, uh, how are we possibly going to convince other countries to stop doing it? So if we're trying to solve this sort of thing, maybe we should start at home trying to solve the fact that Belgium wants to censor the internet and does it. These are the actual official Chinese cyber police. 
This is the, you, you remember the, you know, oops, this is fun. Uh, this is fun to be the Chinese cyber police. They're all cute and cool and, uh, and don't worry. So uh, there are a bunch of things I can talk about China. I don't have enough time to talk about all of them. Uh, but one of the, uh, the critical points, one of the things China did recently from the censorship side is what we call active probing. The idea, so you remember I talked about the pluggable transports where you transform the traffic into something that, that they're not willing to block or they're not able to recognize and you drive up the false positives. In the active probing world, they do a DPI attack to figure out if they think they might want to block it. And if they think they might want to, they connect to the destination themselves, talk the Tor protocol to it, and if it talks Tor back, then they're sure, then they cut it. So they have a nationwide active probing infrastructure where within a few milliseconds of me making a Tor connection, they make a Tor connection, spoofing it from an IP address somewhere in China and follow up and try to connect. So the fix that we have for that is when you're connecting to a bridge, you need to prove knowledge of some secret. And that means the active probing infrastructure, when they, when they connect, they can't prove that they know the secret. And the challenge there is what should the bridge do? when somebody connects and can't show that they know the secret? The, the, the answer is act natural, whatever that means. Do you, do you provide a, an Apache error file? Do you, so the, the answer that we've come up with right now is you wait a random number of seconds and then you hang up. Because if you ever answer anything, that's a fingerprint that they can use to say uh, that is a Tor bridge trying to pretend it's not a Tor bridge. So this is a, a, a terrible arms race going back and forth. Okay, uh, another fun thing we can talk about. Uh, a while ago, uh, a nice guy named Ed Snowden brought a bunch of documents out. He tried to get every single document he could find about Tor in order to give it to us so that we would have as good an understanding as possible about what the intelligence agencies are trying to do uh, with and about Tor. So this is a, a slide deck from, uh, I'm not sure if it's NSA or GCHQ, and I'm really curious which one, uh, where they were talking through, I tried to attack Tor like this and it didn't work. I tried to attack it like this and it didn't work. I tried like this. So it's a, it's a series of Tor stinks, I can't break it, uh, which is a fun slide deck that they used internally at one of their meetings. Another challenge we had there, you see the fine Tor sticker up there on Ed's laptop. This was the first introduction to Tor for a lot of journalists. So we had a lot of people calling us and saying, so what's this uh, Tor thing that Ed invented? Because they had no idea that there was a thing called the Tor Project and that we'd been working on it for 12 years and so on. There's also this great quote in there from one of their slides, as endorsed by the NSA, still the king of high secure, low latency internet anonymity. So on the one hand, yay, they couldn't break Tor as of 2012. Uh, on the other hand, all these intelligence agencies are huge and they have a lot of different groups that don't talk to each other. So we need to make sure not to be too confident based on uh, one group not being able to break it. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a group down the hall that didn't talk to them, that we're working on some other mechanism for being able to do it. But it's still a good sign. The fact in 2012 they were having meetings between NSA and GCHQ because they didn't know how to tackle this confusing Tor thing which distributes uh, trust all around the world. Okay, so you remember the bridge thing I was talking about earlier. Uh, all of that I was talking about in the censorship context, in the context of somebody's trying to connect to the Tor network and we're going to block that connection. But what about the surveillance world? What about the world where we're trying to learn who is connecting to Tor? So one of the other pluggable transports that we've been working on that I'm optimistic in the censorship context and I'm intrigued in the surveillance context is something called Snowflake. So the idea is rather than you, run, you install Tor, you edit a text file, you do things that, that we find normal but most users find confusing, instead you let people volunteer to be a Tor bridge by going to a website with their browser. You give them some JavaScript, it turns them into a JavaScript browser running, uh, into a JavaScript bridge running in their browser, and they do a WebSocket connection into the Tor network and a WebSocket connect, uh, and a WebRTC connection to the censored user. So as far as China or other sensors are seeing, there is a Google Hangout style video chat thing going on from the user in the country to some random web browser and from there the connections being passed on into the Tor network. 
So there are a bunch of cool properties here. One of them is WebRTC. I hope they don't block it. Another one is you get built-in NAT piercing because WebRTC already does uh, all of that. Uh, you get encryption, and you get a whole lot of transient, we call them snowflakes, a whole lot of transient bridges that uh, come up and go down. And if China's goal is to blacklist all the people on our part of the internet running web browsers, that's probably not going to work. So the other thing to think about uh, is the surveillance style of, uh, question, where if they're trying to learn who's connecting to Tor, by building a list of everybody who does WebRTC, everybody who does Google Hangouts, everybody who does internet video chat, that's going to be a much harder uh, approach. OK, so one of the lessons, censorship arms races are crappy because China puts billions of dollars and tens of thousands of people into this sort of thing. But at least you, you have a handle on whether it's working. Like, you try to connect to the Tor network, it doesn't work, you change something, now it works. Your feedback loop is pretty good there. And they've been making it worse by not just, not actually cutting the connection, but throttling it or slowing it down or something. Uh, but at least you have a feedback loop. In the surveillance case, there's no feedback loop. You connect to the Tor network, you don't know if they saw you. You don't know what they're looking at. You don't know what databases they have. You don't know what part of the internet they can see. And you don't, so you don't know whether you should change something. And if you change something, you don't know whether you helped it or you hurt it. So uh, one answer is we need a new ed coming out every week, giving us the, the new documents that they have. Uh, I don't have other answers. So I'd love to chat more about that. OK, let me switch over to another topic in the last 12 minutes. Uh, onion services or hidden services. So everything I talked about before was I want to go to a website without the website learning where I'm coming from. Now let's use that as a building block where I want to connect to another person running the Tor software and I want to do it so that I get a bunch of cool security properties. Uh, and so this is how it looks in practice. Uh, up there you have a blah 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 dot onion address. And this is the Rise Up website running as a Tor client, available and reachable over the Tor network. And that blah, blah, blah is the hash of the key of the Onion service, which gives us a bunch of cool security properties. One of them is it's self-authenticated. If you know the blah, blah, blah dot Onion, you can fetch the key, hash the key, make sure it matches the blah, blah, blah. And that means that you know you're talking to the place that has the private key that corresponds to this address you're trying to go to. So you know the whole certificate authority world where Turkish Telecom can lie to you about whether it's Facebook? We bypass all of that. You get end-to-end -end authentication where you know who you're talking to without needing to rely on DigiCert or VeriSign or Turkish Telecom or Chinese Telecom and so on. Uh, you also get end-to-end -end encryption, and you get a bunch of other cool things. Uh, but one of the questions we were wondering at the beginning, so uh, a while ago there was some idiot on the internet trying to sell drugs, and he set up a website selling drugs, and he put it behind an onion address, and then some cops found him and busted him. And there was some cop who was saying, and the Tor network traffic uh, went down by 50% when we busted this guy. So Tor is only for bad people. And I was thinking, well, shit. That, that's not good. I thought there were millions of Tor users. I thought we had all these you know, good people doing things. I hear good stories. Uh, yeah, there's some, some, some jerk, but you know, that's just one guy. Uh, so then I was thinking, wait a minute, we don't actually have any data about that. We don't have a, a way to, to argue with this guy other than say, him saying, it was half the Tor network, and me saying, I, I hope that's not true. So, at that point, I'm thinking, uh, how do we actually gather data to refute this sort of thing? So here's a graph of the amount of onion service traffic uh, that happens over time. And it's, uh, it's, you know, a gigabit per second or something. But remember, at, ver at the back, back at the beginning of the talk, I was showing you 150 gigabits per second of, uh, of actual Tor load. So it's complicated to figure out what fraction of the Tor network that is. But it's something like 3%. So something like 3% of the traffic on the Tor network has to do with Onion services at all. So it is a tiny little toy that I built back in 2005, and it hasn't gotten much use. It should get a lot more use. There is a lot more potential out there, but it's, it's basically at the very beginning of its lifetime. So that means when you see confusing, terrible iceberg pictures scaring you about the other 99 internets out there that you didn't know about, Try to figure out what their business model is. Try to figure out why they're, why they're trying to scare you with an iceberg slide. 
Is it some sort of threat analytics or threat intelligence or something where they want you to give them a million dollars and they'll tell you if they find you on the dark web or whatever that means? Uh, I actually talked to one of these threat intelligence companies and they said, uh, yeah, we have to say dark web because that, that's what sells, but actually all the interesting stuff we find is from our Pastebin Pro account. We pay Pastebin and they tell us every time a new Pastebin thing happens and that's where all the good stuff is. We don't find anything on Onion Services. They basically don't exist. So another uh, interesting piece of that, a while ago BBC did an article saying, you can buy drugs on the internet and here's how. And the comment section was full of people who were like, oh my god, that's amazing, thanks, thanks. I'll, I don't have to go get shot on the street corner. Uh, wonderful, thank you for telling me about these sort of things. And BBC's business model is they sell ads on their article. So of course they want to write something that people want to read. And then they did a follow up a week later saying, and we bought some and we had them tested and they were really good. So. What was BBC's motivation in writing these things and getting all these people? This was like the most commented on article ever. They had to shut down the comments. Uh, so what, what, what's their business model there? Think about that when, when you see an iceberg slide. So another, another version of that question, what do you think the biggest website on the dark web is? Is it some, some place in Malaysia? Uh, the answer is it's Facebook. A while ago, Facebook was looking at how many users are connecting from the Tor network into Facebook, and they saw over, the, over a one-month period uh, in April a few years ago, they saw a million people logging into Facebook accounts over the Tor network. And they said, uh, wow, users want safety. We should set up an Onion address. We should embrace Tor. We should give them the choices that they're, that they're clearly asking for so that they can uh, connect to our network the way they want to. So one, one, uh, one reason why they do this, they know that there are people in Turkey trying to reach Facebook, and they know that Turkish Telecom is trying to attack the people in Turkey, and Turkish Telecom can lie to them about what, S what HTTPS websites they're seeing. Another key thing to think about here, this is still the Facebook website. It's not like Facebook set up a new internet and put themselves on it or something. There is no dark web. That doesn't even make sense. It's the Facebook website. I was talking to an analyst a while ago who said, I found a copy of Facebook on the dark web. And I'm like, no, there's a computer. It's called Facebook. They're running a website. It's called Facebook.com. You can get to it over HTTP. You can get to it over HTTPS. You can get to it over its Onion address. It's the same computer. It's just a matter of what transport security you get. Do you get HTTP where you get very little encryption and authentication? Do you get HTTPS where you have to rely on one of 300 companies vouching for this thing? Or do you do the Onion address where you don't have to rely on that sort of thing? So there are a couple of other cool use cases for Onion services that, uh, that might expand your idea of what Onion services might be. One of them is SecureDrop. There's another one that's uh, similar called Global Leaks out there in the world. Uh, and the idea is you run a website where people who want to whistleblow or give you anonymous tips for your, like New York Times runs uh, one of these, and you can talk to a journalist safely where you control your own privacy. It's not an anonymous tip line where they promise to keep you safe, but it's up to them. You get to, to control these things. Another fun use case is a tool called Ricochet. It, so you know uh, Jabber, XMPP, Google Chat, all those things. Uh, uh, iChat, iMessage, uh, they're all centralized. There's all, uh, even Signal has a, a central point that knows who you are and who all your friends are and when you talk to them. And that metadata is the really interesting stuff. So there's, there's a juicy middle that you either subpoena them and they give you the answer, or you break in and you get the answer. The cool thing about Ricochet, every user is their own onion service. There is no middle. There's no place to break into. You're all rendezvousing with each other through the Tor network in a way where each of you keeps control of your privacy and your contact and who you're talking to in a way that there's no place to go to attack in order to learn who's doing what. And then a third fun use case is called Onion Share. Imagine you're a journalist and you just got the Ed Snowden documents and you're sitting next to another journalist and you want to share them. You're actually in the same room. What do you do? Do you email them through your Gmail thing? That's probably not a good idea. 
Uh, maybe you put them on Dropbox, but wait, Dropbox looks at all the files. Uh, maybe you put them on a USB key, but we've all been taught that US key, USB keys are bad news. So the answer here is you run a tool called Onion Share, which spins up an Onion service and a website. You uh, ricochet or signal or whatever the URL to your friend. Your friend goes there, downloads the file, and then the website disappears. So it's a transient way of moving a file around on the internet in a way there's, there's nothing there afterwards. It's not like a, a website like Dropbox where they can go subpoena them afterwards. Okay, so uh, another, uh, so some, some wrap-ups to think about. Tor is not magic. Tor is not foolproof. Uh, user error is one of the most common ways where things can go wrong. One piece of that is OPSEC mistakes. Uh, where the idiot trying to sell drugs uh, apparently wrote his name down in various places and, and screwed up in all sorts of ways. So uh, if you're trying to stay safe on the internet, there are a lot of things that you want to think about and a lot of examples of how people have screwed up. Uh, another challenge is metadata uh, browser fingerprints, where it's not just cookies, it's all sorts of other things at the application level that can let the websites recognize you over time. And then another challenge we have is the whole browser exploit world. We are based on Firefox. Uh, Firefox is not the best software out there. No browsers are the best software out there. Browsers are shit. So if you're trying to actually browse the web and be safe, this is a, this is a terrible world to live in. But mm, that's what everybody does. So we also are in that game. And uh, coming up with a way to, to keep you safe from people sending you scary JavaScript and scary images and scary text and scary XML and so on is a challenging world. And I've, I've tried to order these in terms of how, uh, how, how prevalent they are, how relevant they are to ordinary people, because you're much more likely to have an OPSEC problem than, uh, than have an intelligence agency try to look at the entire internet and try to match up who's talking to where and so on. But these are four areas that we think a lot about in terms of keeping people safe. So how can you help? Uh, one answer is uh, we need a lot more relays. You can run an exit relay, which means you're the last hop in the connection and websites are going to get confused about whether, uh, whether it was you or whether it was Tor and sometimes uh, you get the chance to teach law enforcement how Tor works. Uh, or you can run a non-exit relay, which means you're never that third hop in the, in the circuit, in the path, and you are just moving encrypted traffic back and forth inside the Tor network. So whichever of those you're excited about, we need both of them. Another thing we really need is please tell everybody how Tor works. Explain to them why privacy is important, why metadata security is important. Uh, explain to them why the dark web isn't what they think it is, and that guy with the hoodie they saw on the television show is not representing the internet in the way that, that actually matches facts. Another piece, uh, use our software, find bugs. If you're an Android person, download Tor browser Android and try to break it, try to figure out what happened. This summer in July is the PETS conference, Privacy Enhancing Technologies Symposium, where all of the privacy anonymity researchers get together. And it's in Stockholm, which is not so far from here. So in five months or six months or something, consider going there to meet all the researchers. And if you happen to have a real job, uh, we're a nonprofit and we'd love to get a donation. And also this afternoon at 1500 in room H.3244 is a relay operator, operator meetup. If you run a relay or if you want to run a relay, then please come and chat with us. And also, I will be wandering around in a bright green shirt, happy to answer questions uh, for the rest of the day. And I am uh, out of time. Is that? I'm out of time. So thank you, and I'll be around. <laughs>